John, I suppose it's really clear there's been a big campaign behind this. Uh, uh, people related to victims of terror attacks past have said that this is completely necessary. Uh, it's sort of clear why the government is going along with it. Yes, absolutely. And you know, first of all, you have every sympathy with people whose um, children or relatives were killed in an attack like this, and you can understand why you'd want to do it. But I think the issue for um, government and for lawmaking is quite often campaigns like this that are very um, you know, popular emotionally mm. then lead to a lack of scrutiny over what this will actually mean. And you know, MPs and politicians are very happy to climb aboard these laws and endorse them, but they don't necessarily think about the impact it will have on venues and on the wider industry that then has to deal with them. I suppose it makes sense for a, a venue like the Manchester Arena to have a sort of a plan in place with regard to these sorts of things. Uh, but, but looking at the detail of this legislation, venues with capacity of up to 100, uh, of 100 people as, as the sort of minimum, that, that would include most pubs, that would include churches. These are not rich organisations. Absolutely. And if you look at the inquiry into the Manchester Arena bombing and the response to it, you see there's a lot there about how the MEN Arena did have a plan in place. The um, security contractors also had plans around um, terrorism awareness, but those didn't stand up on the night. But what you're doing is pushing this to bigger venues, to smaller venues, mm -hmm. as you say, often poorer organisations, um, community-run organisations, and it's just another burden on them. Mm. Either they have to pay someone to come and do it or they kind of have to make it up themselves. Mm. Um, there's the risk of scrutiny and a lot, either it's a cost they can't bear or it's an administrative burden that just makes running your local community centre a bit harder, annoys the volunteers and they're less willing to do it. it it's, it's worth exploring this particular point in greater detail. The Manchester Arena had a plan for issues like terrorism. Uh, they had a plan that this law might well uh, mandate, and yet it still went horribly wrong. Yes, so if you look into the, um, the report into the Manchester bombing and the aftermath, which was a big sort of judge-led inquiry, it looks at you know, how the event staff were trained on terrorism, and it said that they did a reasonably good job of it, but perhaps it didn't have the urgency it might have had. And what you had is, you know, security guards who are sort of paid minimum wage basically to make sure no one's causing trouble, mm. you know, understandably not intervening when they saw someone who's potentially a terrorist. They were afraid of being labelled as racist for calling out an Asian man with a backpack was one of the things. But also you had massive statutory bodies. You look at some of the biggest criticisms in the report were for the fire brigade, the ambulance and the police service. There was no one person in charge of the emergency services response. The fire brigade had um, a period of about 90 minutes where no one knew who was in charge of the fire brigade response. Mm. Two of the police officers who were meant to be on duty took a two hour um, evening meal break and went for a five mile drive to go and get a kebab. So th uh, this is failings within the emergency services rather than the venues in this specific case. But, but I suppose people are perhaps rightly very afraid of terrorism. It's something that is by its very nature terrorising. Um, don't, is, there, is there not potentially an argument that there's a pro-business case for this red tape that says that if people think that venues have these sorts of plans in place, they're more likely to go out and spend their money, feel safer in society? There is potentially that, but I think there's a great Mike Tyson line that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> and this regime is going to come in and we're going to have no idea whether these plans that sit in a folder somewhere are actually effective. Mm. You know, and ultimately... The bulk of counter-terrorism relies on the police, the security services, and also this is a vanishingly rare threat. You know, it is terrible and it's devastating when it happens, mm. but you know, there has been one bombing on this scale in the last 10 or 15 years since the 7-7 attacks. Mm. There have been a small number of other terror attacks, but it is so, so rare that I think most people, when they go out, um, it doesn't factor into their minds that much. And again, going back to the Manchester Inquiry report, one of the criticisms was people were not reacting as strongly as they could because we got used to the um, threat level being at severe. Right. So it had become part of the part and parcel of the briefings for the staff. So it did sit on the back burner.